All right, uh, let's turn our Bibles to Titus 2 uh, for a moment. And this is the chapter we've been literally stuck on for the past, I don't know, how many weeks? Uh, but I think the last time we were here, it was around November or December before Christmas. Uh, and, and it's because of that one word, uh, salvation. So let's go to Titus chapter 2. Uh, and, and again, it's actually easy to just pass over that word. Um, ass, you know, if we assume that everybody just knows what salvation is. Uh, but, but, but this word is so weighty. There's so much involved with this word. Uh, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Uh, this is somewhat of a, of a gospel presentation uh, toward the end of the letter. Um, but it's clear, verse 11, the grace of God, referring to Christ, Christ has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, we have to clarify the phrase, all men. Uh, is that, does that mean everyone is going to get saved or whatnot? But when you talk about the word salvation, you know, people would read that and just think, oh yeah, I know what it means. It means people are saved. But there's so much aspects of salvation that that people are not discussing and i and i believe uh not just from my own conviction but from all the books that i've read about uh, these you know pastors biblical pastors in the past when they write up uh, their own you know writings and they're discussing what the issue was in the 1800s you know early 1920s uh, the puritan times it's it's always the same. Even going all the way back to the 1500s with Jonathan Edwards, it's it's always been one problem, and that one problem is the church keeps forgetting to ask the question, "Who is a true believer?" And every time they ask that question, and when churches do, by God's grace, there's a revival, there's a change, there's a transformation in the life of the church. But when we say just the general church, like the public church, the the, the churches of different areas, whatnot. It's always a temptation for ministries to go off track and, you know, pretty much go off on a rabbit's trail and lose the main focus of this issue called salvation. Uh, and, and we're not just talking about, you know, the basic of the presentation of the gospel. Because there was one time I remember growing up hearing on the radio at that time where there was no YouTube you know I, I grew up just listening to Christian radio there was TV but there was you can't really watch it on TV and they're always discussing this issue of what's the minimum requirement of the gospel so that when you hear it you'll get saved and I kind of bought into that and so I was, also, I was also kind of going through what is the minimum the bare minimum and then I realized as time went on there is no such thing as the bare minimum the gospel is a message and the message needs to be made clear. Uh, sometimes it's a short message, long message. It all depends on really who you're talking to, but there's no way to dumb it down because that's what they were basically saying. And then you got the four spiritual laws uh, with the prayer at the end, do you want to receive Christ? So recite this prayer and Jesus will come into your heart. And it, it came down to that where, where it was just a formula, do this, say this, meaning with all of your heart and God will, you know, or you will receive God into your heart. It, it wasn't so much God will receive you. It was you need to receive God. As I hear, open up the door of my heart, please come in. But then we fail to realize that it is him who's deciding to accept us or not. Um, and so with all of this confusion about salvation, it's always good when we come across that word to really take time and to go over it again especially with people's testimonies. Every time you listen to someone's testimony, you're listening carefully to see if that person actually is a true what? Believer. But today, when people give testimonies, the current trend is that you shouldn't judge. Don't judge people's testimony. Don't judge people's experiences. It's all unique. God works in mysterious ways. 
and, and, they, and they fail to realize or they fail to understand and acknowledge the fact that people who get saved in the scripture, there's only one way. There's only one way people get saved. But everyone's like, well, you know, God can do things outside of scripture. And yeah, I, can, I, I understand that to a certain extent. But when it comes to salvation, he only has one way. You know, one particular message. Um, and you, got, you get, you know, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> the testimony by Dr. Paul Lim. I don't know who he is. I just randomly kind of searched and saw this guy and listened to him. And, you know, I guess I, the YouTube title was, he's from a graduate of Yale, which just, just the word itself just kind of elevates the credentials there. And, we, I, I, and I was curious, uh, what does he have to say? And I was hoping he'll say something like, all the knowledge at Yale meant, meant nothing. I'm a fool, of, I'm a fool uh, to think that, and I am now a servant and a slave of Christ, da 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 But as I was listening carefully, I realized this man, most likely, in my opinion, in judgment from the scripture, <laughs> is not saved. Uh, and you know, when people hear that, they'll say, you know, how can you be so unloving, unaccepting, who are you to judge? But the scripture says we need to discern. Um, there's another guy named Rob Bell. Now, by now, he's really, really f famous. He's known to be the, one of the key figures in the emerging church movement. Uh, and he is bizarre, uh, but he has a church. I think the church is called Mars Hill or something. Uh, but he was interviewed by Oprah. And I, want, I wanted to just let you listen to this uh, this interview just to he just listen to what he says about you know uh, questions that she's asking him okay so all right here we go okay what is the soul it's the thing that keeps telling you there's more there's more this isn't just a meal. This isn't just a person. This isn't just an embrace. This isn't just an interview. There's more. Yeah. There's more. Your definition of God? Like a song you hear in another room and you think, boy, that sounds beautiful, but I only can hear a little bit. And so you start opening doors and rearranging furniture because you have to get in that room to hear that song. And when you get in, you find the knobs and you turn them all on the right because you're like, I got to hear more of that. And then you open the windows because you want the people in the next houses to hear it. What's the difference between religion and spirituality? Or is there a difference? Well, you know, some say that religious people don't want to go to hell and spirituality people who've been to hell already. <laughs> um, religion should be the structures, the prayer tables, the things that you do in the course. It should help you. It should cultivate. It should be the practices. It should be the symbols. It should be the rituals that cultivate your sense that there's more. What does prayer mean to you? Prayer to me is usually one word which is yes yes i'm open what's next that's what it is what is the lesson it's taken you the longest to learn that there's nothing to prove when you're young you start out and you're like what is one lesson that you finally learned <laughs> i can work harder i can work faster i'm smarter look at me respect everybody understand and then later you realize that there's nothing to prove all it's left to do is enjoy. What do you think happens when we die? I think there's a ton of... Oh! Because there's all these people that have gone before you. And some people say, well, then you meet God. I think, yeah, but I never met my grandpa on my dad's side. So actually, when I think of, like, dying, I think of, I'll get to meet Preston. Mm. That's actually what I think of first. I don't think of sort of gold and a, a, a throne and like a, hello, Rob, well done. You're <laughs> strange, but I like you anyway. I don't, I don't think of that. I think of like my grandpa that I never met. To be honest. And like heritage and family bloodline. All of them who came before you. Yeah, I somehow think of flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. I think of like... You think you're going to see them? People I've heard about. Mm -hmm. I do. And actually. will they be in flesh and blood? Maybe at some point we're known for our essence and whatever that looks like or feels like. What do you know for sure? 
that you can say yes to this moment and experience a joy that can't be put into words. That is actually possible. I know that for sure. The world needs, finish that sentence, the world needs. All of us to wake up. I believe. That we're going to be fine. I really do. Heaven is. Here and now and then and there and at hand and among us and upon us and available and real. God is. Oh, love. <laughs> Let's stick to the stick to that one. God is love. Yeah. My favorite thing to do on Sunday morning is. Um, my thirteen-year-old son and I will often go surfing. And we'll be sitting. We'll be sitting in the water. And it's quiet. And sometimes a dolphin will go by, and we'll talk. And it's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, he's a, he is a, he is a, he is a heretic. Okay, he's a outright heretic. Uh, um, there was another interview where this guy was asking him, "Is it a sin for homosexual couples to come together?" And he said, he literally said, um. Uh, it's not wrong for people who love each other to be with each other. That was his answer. And then another question was, what is sin? Isn't it sin? He said, well, sin is simply a disruption of the shalom, which is the disruption of peace that God wants for all of us. And so as long as it doesn't disrupt our peace, it's not sin. Yeah, there's not, no mention of the breaking of the law of God, offending God, uh, grieving the Holy Spirit. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, you know, researching Rob Bell is a whole new topic that we're, go we're not, we're not going to really do. But what I'm trying to, sh to show you with this is, is to answer that question, why are there so many different, you know, things on, you know, on the internet with regards to believers? Well, because believers don't understand the what? The gospel. Uh, I understand that there are different denominations, that there are a diff little bit of a differences of like theology, you know, dispensationalism, Presbyterian, you know, Methodist and all that, those I can understand. But, you know, with all of that said, there is a commonality with, you know, those denominational differences. But now there's no issue, there's no understanding of even denominational doctrinal differences because there's no issue of discussing the salvation, doctrines of salvation, because no one's really even asking the question, who's really, really saved and who's not, you know, who's not saved. Uh, everyone is just accepted as believers now. Especially when a pastor, uh, like let's say just one or two pastors, they want to do something. They want to start a project. They want to start this movement. Well, think about it. They need as many people as possible to get on board. They're not going to be asking the question, who is a what? Christian, they'll go to churches, they'll give sermons, and they'll get, they'll get people rallied up to their cause, and they're just happy everyone, you know, all these people are signing up. They don't care who is and who is not a what? A believer. You know, with church growth movement today, uh, when, they, um, when they start churches, what do you need? You need money. Well, who's got the money? People. So let's get people to come into church, so now they're just going to open it up, Whoever comes, they're going to say, oh, we're all believers gathering together to worship God. Rarely will you have a refinement process or a filtering out process where you interview them and tell them, you know, lovingly, but, you know, clearly, you, you, we don't think you're saved. Now, you can imagine the offense people will take at that. They join this ministry. It was a church plant. They want to be part of it. And then you're told you're not a believer. What do you think they're going to do? They, you know, unless they're really convicted by the Holy Spirit, they'll probably take off and never come back you know, again. Um, the, the, <clears throat> the church needs to ask the right question. The right questions are, how do I become a Christian? Uh, how do I know if I'm a Christian? Uh, how does the Holy Spirit... Uh, bring an unbeliever to repentance and conversion. You know, who is an actual Christian? Uh, the wrong questions are things like, how do we get people to come to church? 
you know, how do we seek out the unchurched? Uh, what is the most relevant topic in the lives of young people? And let's tackle that, you know, you know, in the church. You know, how do we let people feel important in the church? Um, uh, what is the potential of my life in God? Uh, how do I handle loneliness? How do I handle being single? Is God going to bless me? These are all questions that are answered as you study the scripture, but that's not the main question. Uh, I think maybe if I have to put a percentage down, you know, 80% of the work of a pastor is done uh, or the ministry when you help someone understand salvation. Because once you get to that point and you clearly know what salvation is and what is not, everything just kind of falls into its place. You know, you know your identity, you know what you have to do, you know what you have to cut off, you know what your focus has to be on, you understand your life's goal and what's what's eternal, what's temporal, um, and, and your, your life just starts to change because you realize if since this is genuine salvation, I cannot live the way I do if I'm going to understand what true salvation actually what is. But what do you have right now? What you have in the church is you have all these people um, who may be saved, maybe not saved, but they don't understand. And because they don't understand uh, the salvation issues, they don't understand certain things that the pastor is telling them to do and certain things not to what, not to do. Uh, you know, it just becomes an issue of, is it, is it black or white or is it gray area? And they're asking all these questions because the concern is not so much what happens, you know, in terms of the conversion, you know, conversion process. And so we come to, you know, Titus chapter 2 and we look at the word salvation and we just have to park it there and go through in detail what it is to be saved. Now, to do that, we're going to look at what you call the order of you know, salvation. And the proposed order is that, number one, for someone to be, be saved, there must be predestination. Okay, there must be predestination or election. Okay, and that's found in, you know, um, all throughout Scripture. Uh, you have uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 being you know, very, very, very clear before the foundation of the world, he chose, okay? You were predestined before the foundation of this world. Well, predestination is something we, we can't do, okay? But, uh, you know, you know it's, it's before we, we even existed. After we are born, if we've been predestined, there's what you call the effectual call, okay? Um, Okay. The effectual call, or we'll call that regeneration, when a person actually becomes uh, a believer. Now, steps two, three, four, and five, I guess I'll do this in red color. It's almost simultaneous. Two, three, four, and five. Uh, three would be um, conversion. Okay, And that's where you'll see a man or woman Re display repentance and faith. Uh, and then you got justification. Uh, it's a declaration by God that you are saved or you are righteous. And then you got adoption. Okay, you're placed into the family of God. Okay, um, now again, this right here is like instantaneous, okay? But if you had to put an order to it, uh, this will be the appropriate order. And you'll see certain verses that make that absolutely clear, especially about repentance coming after or faith coming after regeneration. You know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, that kind of question. What comes first, regeneration or faith? And there's been debates about this. There's a verse in the scripture, as we will see in a few seconds or a few minutes, uh, that is clear that that God actually had to regenerate the heart for him to start having or displaying faith, okay? Uh, and then you got number six, and this is post-salvation. You have sanctification, you know, after you are saved. Uh, this is the process by which you start growing in Christ and becoming more holy. And then you have perseverance, and this is one of those doctrines 
that clearly indicates that a genuine believer who's been regenerated will remain in Christ till the very end. He's not going to capitulate. Okay? He's not going to turn into an apostate. Uh, and number eight, lastly, and when we die and we see Christ and God, we will be glorified. And we call this glorification when we receive new bodies and we are made perfect before Him. And so we're focusing in on steps two, three, four, and five. The effectual call, conversion, justification, and adoption. And I think here, I think the most important will be the the effectual call. You know, when the gospel is presented, um, you know, what needs to be said. And effectual means when someone gives the gospel to someone who's been predestined and it's, it's the right time, God will draw that person through that message and, and convert them. Okay? Uh, there's the general call where people who are not saved will hear the call, but they will not actually respond. Okay? So they are not uh, they have not been predestined. And so the, some of the questions that we had to ask uh, was, what does a sinner, okay? Now we're not, uh, we're particularly looking at someone who's been elected, okay? But in terms of the human perspective, we'll simply call them the what? You know, the sinner, okay? We're not going to say the elected sinner, okay? A sinner. We don't know who the elect are. So what does the sinner need to hear before he believes well that's obvious in chapter uh, chapter 1 of Romans Romans 1 16 and Romans chapter 10 verse 17 turn with me again to Romans 1 16 and this verse you can turn this into like a math equation okay it says I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is and so you could put an equal sign there the gospel equals the power of God. Okay. For salvation to everyone who believes. And so I'm going to put an arrow pointing down and saying that this power of God is what brings salvation to a, a sinner, an unregenerate sinner. So, uh, gospel obviously is a, is a term that just means good news, the message of the truth. Okay, so I'll put here truth. Okay. And so it's clear, according to Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power. Okay? It's not our persuasion or our speech or our vocabulary you know, that we use or who we are you know, as a friend of somebody or some testimony. You know, we say things like, you know, you need to have your life needs to present the gospel. That is true. Okay, that is true. That we call that lifestyle evangelism. But no matter how blameless your life is, if you stay quiet, it's not the gospel. The gospel is truth spoken to somebody. And so you have to speak that. And when you do, that is the power in which God uses to bring what? To bring salvation. So if you go in order, if there is no clear presentation of the gospel, there is no power of God residing in that discussion, there will not be any what? salvation and so you know when we talk to people this is the first thing we're looking for when you say you became a believer it's not so much when you know do you remember the date when you became a Christian no it's do you remember the message that you heard what is it that you heard and then you believed Okay, I believe in the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who what? Believes. Okay, when you believe the gospel after you've heard it. Now, if you go to the Romans chapter 10, again, it, it re-emphasizes again the whole idea of listening. Okay, listening to the message. It's not so much seeing a person's life that will save you. It's listening. If you go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, please turn with me. See, let me redraw it this way. I'll say, 
um, the word of Christ. Okay, and faith. Okay. So Romans 10, 17, Paul says, faith comes from hearing. Okay. Hearing what? Hearing by the word of Christ. And so we can circle gospel and relate that and say another way of looking at the gospel is simply the word of what? The word of Christ. Now, if you want to put it that way, the gospel basically is not a message of man. It is the voice of Christ. So when you preach the gospel correctly, Christ is literally declaring his word to that sinner. And if that sinner is an elected sinner, a predestined sinner, there will be an effectual call. If that sinner has not been elected, they will reject the voice of what? Christ. So ultimately, what is salvation? Or what is conversion? What is this process of being saved? It's the day when you hear the voice of Christ calling your name to come to Him in faith and in repentance and trust. You don't have that. You don't have people saying that today in their testimonies. They're more interested in telling them about the circumstance. You know, I was walking to church and then a car swerved in front of me and I got knocked back and someone had their Bible open and I ran into him. Wow, it must be from God. Because when I fell flat on my face into the Bible on the ground, it was open to John 3, 16. And, and I happened to read it. And then I realized, wow, God saved me from this car accident. I believe him. And then they'll go around telling that testimony. And he will go around thinking that experience was by God. Well, that was just a hypothetical situation I just made up, okay? But whatever the experience or circumstance might be, this is, it has to fit this. Okay, do you guys understand? It has to fit this. You, you can't say, I don't know if my, I heard his voice, but I do believe, I just don't know when. I don't remember at all, but I just believe Christ. I do right now. But... You have to be honest. When, did, when was it when you first began to hear the voice of Christ? You know, it could be through a sermon, through Bible study, through some radio, Christian radio, whatever. It had to be by someone who's a believer. That's what Paul is saying. Look at verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not, what? Heard. And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? And so how beautiful are the feet of th those who bring good news? Okay. And so verse 17, faith comes from hearing. Now verse 16 is like a, like a little break there to indicate so many preachers were sent to Israel, but they did not what? Believe. Because he's saying they were not chosen. They were not truly chosen of God. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Of Christ and so the so the first question we have to ask somebody or as we're listening to their testimony that's what we're listening for so when I'm listening to someone's testimony it's always about Romans 1 16 and Romans 10 17 I'm looking for I mean they might get lost in the circumstance they're like talking about this experience that they had they were you know whatever 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 you know they're going through all this stuff but I'm listening I'm trying to sort it all out I'm listening when can you give me an indication that you heard the message of the truth and that brought conviction to your heart. The Holy Spirit opened your eyes and then you start realizing, I'm actually listening to the voice of what? Christ. See, you can, if you had to simplify it in like a nutshell, the gospel message is simply Christ standing in front of you and calling you. That's basically what it is. You know, like, if you compare all the gospel presentations of Christ in the gospels with the way Peter and John, Peter uh, and, and, and Paul and the others, when they preach the gospel, it's slightly different. Why? They were not Jesus Christ. You know, when Jesus went to the Samaritan woman, he didn't have to tell her, you know, do you know this doctrine, that doctrine? You know, did you know that you were made by me and you have to, um, 
you know, you have to worship me, but you're not, and da 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 da. She didn't have to do that because he was the God speaking directly to her. And when he opened her eyes, she knew it was her God. And she, she, and it, you know, and she believed. She, 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 she did what he told her to do. Because he was standing right there. You know, he didn't have to tell her repent. You know, I mean, he implied that by saying, "How many husbands do you what have this, this and that?" But remember, when we studied that passage, Jesus Christ was talking like this. She was responding like what, like this, meaning up to the, up to a certain point. Their conversation didn't even connect. You know, everyone's like, this is the perfect technique of how to evangelize. Jesus was building a bridge with the Samaritan woman, but if you study it carefully, there was no bridge. <laughs> you know, he, he, he told her, uh, the water I give you will never, it will cause you to never thirst. And she's like, give me this physical water. She didn't even get the metaphor. <laughs> She goes, please tell me this. Where do I get this magic water? And so it was this. There was no connection until the Lord at a certain point opened her eyes and she looked at him and realized this is Christ, her God, speaking directly to her. And then she went and preached the gospel all, all throughout the town, brought them out, and the whole Samaritan town got saved. So when we preach the gospel, this is basically what's going on. You know, when you talk about what do I say? You know, what do I say? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, uh, in, in a bit. You're basically going to have to give them the truth of who Christ is, describing Him, uh, describing what He's done, describing who they are in relationship to Him and the brokenness of that relationship. Basically, at the end of the day, what they need to understand when they go home is that I've heard the voice of Christ. Obviously, only true believers or those who are elect uh, and been given the grace will understand wow, Jesus Christ was speaking to me. You know, when we ask people like, uh, yeah, who, who, who gave you the gospel? Oh, well, so-and-so did. But if we ask them what exactly happened that day, you'll say, well, God spoke to me. You know, Christ spoke to me through that person. You know? and, and so conversion is when a person who has been alienated by God because of his sin returns and sees Christ. It's like that scene, you know, when the, the prodigal son, what, comes back, you know? Uh, that's, that's when salvation begins. He believes. It's not, again, so much of like, uh, I'm going to go to hell and I don't want to, so I believe. I'm so guilty, so Lord forgive me, I'm free. It, it's all about the gospel, the message driving a person to meet the person whom he has offended and is willing to forgive and who has died on the cross for him. And so we've turned the gospel into like some mechanical situation when it's actually Jesus Christ meeting them for the first what time or them recognizing that Jesus Christ is who he is for the first time. And then you get all these weird weirdos, right? They're like, yeah, I believe in the gospel. Now I need to, I need to get to know Christ. Well, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, well, I want to know more because I don't really know him. I just know the gospel. Wait, are you sure you're even saved? Because one of the questions that we put on our baptismal questionnaire is, who is Christ to you? And the answer has to be, my Abba, what? Father. The Spirit within us testifies that, the, that, that God is our what? Father. You don't tell a child, I'm your dad, and you have to convince them. They know you are his what? You know, you're his father. So in that sense, a true believer is someone who immediately understands and recognizes Jesus Christ, and that's who he, who, who he is believing into. There's no like second step, now I need to know the person. It's like, I believe in the message, now I need to know the person, now I need to go into discipleship, you know, and now I have to start growing. There's like all these tiers and levels. It's the, it's, it's, salvation or conversion is basically becoming one with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But according to Romans 1.16 and Romans 7.15, it begins not by some esoteric, mystical experience of feeling God's presence, it's by listening. So the experience that we experience on church every Sunday, the most mystical that it gets, it's someone just speaking in the pulpit to you. That's how God designed our Christian experience. 
We don't turn on the light, turn on candles, sing a song, and feel the tingling down our spine. We hear a preacher speak words, and that is literally our experience of listening to the voice of what? Voice of Christ. We were saved that way, and we continue on our life that way. And that's why we have what you call Sunday service, you know, these Friday night Bible studies. We gather together to hear someone declare the voice of what? Christ. But it's not like that anymore. You see, if you watch a video by Francis Chan, again, I, I, you know, he, he graduated from our seminary. I used to really, really look up to him. Now I'm just like, where is he going? Um, he, you know, he doesn't declare the word of God anymore. He's always just like, well, you know, just like, he does, it's like just listen to what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to offend you, you know. And for the relationship seminar, he had a couch up there and he's like, wife, come up here and now she's going to talk to you sisters because I, I, can't, I can't talk to you ladies because I don't know what it's like to be a wife, you know. I'm going to let my wife tell you what she does, you know, in terms of our marriage. And so you can follow her and, you know, and then he sits down and, and that's their Sunday service. You know, a husband and wife sitting on the couch just talking to people. But, you know, Okay, I'm a guy. I don't really understand women, you know, complete sense. I have a wife. I'm still, dis- I'm still understanding. But does the scripture give me the authority to teach a wife how to live? Yes. I'm just going to declare to you what the Bible says because that's the voice of Christ. And he always speaks through a, male, a, male, a, a, a man from the pulpit. And so you, got, you have these situations now in the church where everyone's trying to change the way churches are done. Um... To fit the society. But ever since Ezra existed, right, Ezra, do you remember Nehemiah with the building up of the wall? It says that they built the wooden podium and they spoke. It's never changed. It's always been the same thing, a preacher preaching God's word. And that's basically what the gospel presentation is. We preach the truth, the word of Christ, and when they listen, they will hear Christ if God gives them the ability to believe. So, that's the first question. How do you know if you're saved? Well, what message did you hear? Now, you might not remember every single bit to that message, but clearly, if, it, if this is the day that God calls you, I don't think you'll ever forget that. You know, we, we don't forget the day we were asked out, and you know, our sweet one, our beloved you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, and when we first start the day, we, we will never forget that. We will never forget the day that God called us unto you know himself now people will say well you know in the bible there are all these different ways of evangelizing and different things like jesus christ didn't say the exact same thing as peter did on his you know on the day of the pentecost and preaching to the gospel well the answer to that is very simple the presentation of the gospel in the bible seem different because they're always tailored to the audience um, that they're talking to you know, when Peter preached to the 2,000, uh, the 3,000, the multitudes of the Jews, he, it was different than how Paul preached to the people in, on Mars Hill because the audiences were different. The Jewish audience already had a good, solid foundation of the Old Testament faith. You know, the requirements of God and, and the waiting for the Messiah. The people on Mars Hill, these Greek philosophers or the people there, had no idea what that was. And so Paul had to go all the way back down to creation and simply say, this God actually created you from scratch. He still, he is your what? Your creator. But as you look at their outline, you keep going down, they have, they both emphasize his lordship. They both emphasize the resurrection of Christ. They both emphasize guilt toward God. They both emphasize repentance. And, and so... The point is this, when you give the gospel to somebody, it's never going to be a cookie cutter message. Now, you can have a basic outline, and I, I do have a basic outline, but we call this the bridge illustration. You know, we start off by God creating you, and man's rebellion, and then the separation from God and man. Man's a sinner, the penalty of sin is death, and then the cross, uh, and then faith. But I realized as I talk to people through that outline, someone will emphasize or question or ask questions about this first part. Someone needs more time on apologetics, like how was the Bible written? 
and then you go off topic for a little bit. Different people need different information, and so you have to tailor the Word of God to the, to the person who is listening uh, without holding back the main components of the gospel, which ultimately comes down to Jesus made you, you've offended Him, and you've rejected Him. You must repent, believe His death on the cross is sufficient for all the wrath, all the punishment that God has for you. It's all satisfied in, in Christ. And by faith, you, will re- you can receive entrance into the kingdom of God. He'll become one with you. So the basic components, I just told me to make this clear. Okay, number one, the basic components. So you want, what you want to do is build, build on this. You always want to emphasize, number one, the authority, okay, um, of the Lord, okay, the authority of the Lord Almighty. As you heard Rob Bell say to Oprah in his response, who is God? He straight out said, God is what? Love. God is love. They don't care about his authority. They don't care about his, uh, his, um, his, his magnificence and his, his brilliance and, his, um, and that he is to be feared, okay? We need to start by saying that God, while He is loving, He is the Lord God Almighty. And you can emphasize that through Him being our Creator. Uh, uh, the words, the phrase, every time it refers to God in the Old Testament, it says, the Lord God. And in Isaiah chapter 6, He calls Him thrice holy. Holy, holy, and what? Holy, okay? Number two, uh, the demand. Okay? And people hate this word, but there is a demand of worship. Every creature of God made in the image of God are called to worship God, the demand of worship of God. Okay? This, is, um, this demand, it, it, it's innate. Okay? It, it's, it's not so much that you have to do this, uh, it's you're going to do this. Okay, now, and how, where, do we, where do we get that? Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Worshipping is an innate feature. The demand is that we have to worship the one true God, not other things or other false religion. Uh, verse 21 of Romans chapter 1. Okay, it says, Even though they knew. Okay, the word they is referring to just general creatures made in the image of God, human beings. They knew. What do they know? They knew, okay? First of all, they knew God. They know that God made them. Number two, they know that they do not honor. And three, they do not give what? Give thanks. So what Paul is saying is, they know they have to do this, but they're not. What does that mean? It basically means every person on the face of this planet knows God's existence, know that they have to honor Him, okay, and know that they have to give what? Give thanks. It's really interesting when you talk to atheists, more often than not, when you ask them, even though they've never been to church, they never read their Bible, you'll say, if you suppose that God did exist, how should you respond to Him? More often than not, you always hear them say, we should be thankful that He made us. And I'm like, do you, not, do you know that Bible knew you are going to say that? The verse in the Bible actually says you are going to say that. And I'll show it to him. And he's like, oh, okay. You know, trying to play it off. But, but, but yeah, every, every creature on, on earth knows that they ought to be. So again, why do they have this ought feeling? Because it's innate. Everyone was made to be a what? A worshiper. So this is where you emphasize their guilt. Okay? If you don't, you are guilty. You are a sinner because you are not worshiping the Lord God. And so three, you emphasize the fallenness of men. You are fallen, okay, you failed. You might want to use this word because no one likes to use the word failure anymore. It's like a politically incorrect term now, right? You didn't fail, you just didn't make it yet. <laughs> you know? They're trying to like make it positive. 
but we failed to to worship God. We failed, or uh, Romans three twenty three says this way: we all fall short of what of His glory. Okay, we all fall short of His what His glory. That that's just a nice way of saying we failed. Okay, we've fallen short. Um, number four: the need of a savior. Okay. Or, I want to put it this way, the helplessness of every man, okay? Man is absolutely hopeless and what? You know, and helpless, okay? Uh, and this is what you do want to emphasize to that person that you really cannot do anything to save yourself, to get rid of your guilt. You're pretty much hopeless without, without Christ. And then, fifthly, okay, the recognition And acceptance of Christ. And you can just, you know, this is faith, okay? Uh, I guess you can include their repentance. Well, I'm going to put that in number six. Now, we'll clarify the order here a little bit in a little bit. There must be a recognition, acceptance of Christ, and belief, which also includes what? You know repentance. So you need, to, but you need to emphasize that it's not just uh, 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 accepting that Christ is Lord, but that you have, you also have to, uh, uh, you also have to repent from your ways. Basically, you know, turn away from your lifestyle and commit yourself to living for Him, uh, which also indicates here the commitment to obey. Okay, um, and. Trust. Now you can you can change up the order a little bit, but I'm just saying these are the main components. So um, emphasis is on the authority of the Lord, that He is God Almighty. He demands worship of all the creatures that He created. Okay, and we know we ought to do this, but we're not. So we are fallen. We fail to bring Him glory. We fall short of that. We need a Savior because we are helpless. You need to turn, first of all, recognize who Jesus is, accept Him as who He is, repent from your sin because of who He is, commitment to obey, okay? You must commit to obedience, 100%, and trust in, trust in Him. Now again, with different people, you're going to have to focus on different you know, issues, you know, like they might be going through like a breakup or some marital conflict or job issues, financial issues, some struggle, whatever it is, you're going to have to help weave them through all that problem and bring this out as, as lovingly and as gently, but as clearly as possible. Now, um, for tonight, I want to focus on this issue called depravity, okay? Now, I think after tonight, next week, we're going to just summarize it so like really clearly, okay? Um, but we have to get into very, very specific details uh, with regards to uh, the theology of, of salvation. Um, and just as a side note, um, this is what real... Um, this is what the church needs, okay? Uh, when we talk about a sermon, uh, sometimes um, there's like an oversimplification of the message. Just... Pastor, can you wrap it up in three points? You know, make an acrostic, boom, 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 get through it, and that's like a, a sermon. Um, the Puritans, when they preached, they did have an acrostic at times. They had like a three-point outline, but it was really thorough. If you read some of their writings, it gets really detailed and thorough, and maybe they had a better, more, more attention span than we do now. But Ideally, every single person in the church should be studying the Bible on their own in detail, but that obviously doesn't happen. And then, in, in, and to compile that, the church the pastors or teachers don't teach as specifically as they ought to because of time and because they want to kind of wrap it up and move on to the next subject. I realized that to really help people, the best way to help people, at least from my end to your end, is to get as specific as what possible. You know, without sounding too like boring or too academic or, or, or whatnot, we have to know details of the message of the truth that we are 
we are studying. And so that's how we're really kind of like digging deep when we're just studying Titus chapter 2, verse 11, uh, with the word salvation. We're kind of dig as deep as we possibly can and then come out for error in a few weeks. Okay? So don't drown. Don't drown. Don't spiritually drown. Now, the topic of depravity is very, very important. Why? Uh, we understand the effectual call. God will actually call uh, a sinner who's been elected and they will come to Christ. But whether they are elected or not, uh, everyone, is, everyone is depraved. So even though there might be some sinners who are elected, elected sinners and non-elected sinners, they're all commonly depraved. Everyone is what? Depraved. No one has any capability of turning to God on their own. Again, as it says in Romans 1.21, okay, like they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but notice what it says here, they became futile in their speculation. Okay, they, they're futile. It's useless. Their thought processes have become completely useless. It, it, it just won't work. That's what it's saying. Um, Romans 1.28 okay? And this is quite interesting. MacArthur made um, a, a, an implication. He, he didn't outright say this. Like This is exactly what this is referring to. But look at verse 28, it says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a what? A depraved mind. And he says, you know what, can this be referring to the whole homosexual, I mean, the, the transgender movement? Where you have people outrightly saying that they can change their gender by... Just choosing to. Because what he's saying was, if you go down from verse 24, down to that passage, verse 24 talks about idolatry, worshiping and serving the creature, and then it moves on into lesbianism. God gave them over to degrading passions, woman to woman, man to man. And then the third, verse 28, is this thing called a depraved mind. And MacArthur said, I've always wondered what exactly this was referring to. And he said, could this be that this era that we live in is the actual expression of a what? Depraved mind. To do those things which are not proper, filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder. I mean, those are obviously been there throughout history. But he was saying, this mind that's been depraved is clearly being shown today in this whole transgender movement. Point being, okay, the human man, whether you're elect or not, is completely unable to respond to God in their mind, in their heart. There's absolutely no way. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, makes it clear that they are dead. Okay? Dead. Dead in sin. They're not alive. A dead person cannot respond. A dead person cannot react. In 1 Corinthians chapter, 12, chapter 2, verse um, uh, 14, talking about the natural man, okay, he does not, okay, notice, notice the indicative here, he does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. And so when you talk to a natural man, a natural man does not accept. And that's the key. Okay, He is depraved. He will not absolutely. Okay, So no man. So whether you're elect or not, you just will not accept the Gospel. Okay, the truth. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, you also have another factor here, Satan. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, you have your satanic opposition. So, we are just, you know, completely unable, okay? Verse 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, In whose case 
The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So clearly it says here, they might not see the light of the what? The gospel. So you got double compounding. The heart is unable to see God. The eyes cannot also see God because Satan covers it and your, your own blackness of your sin, of your heart, you know, blinds you to the goodness and the, the, voice, of, the voice of God. Okay? Um, complete depravity. Okay? Now, one of the reasons why I love studying about the depravity of man is because this really helps me remember there's no way I could have accepted Christ on my own. There's just absolutely no way. And that's the point. No one can become a Christian on their what? Own. Now again, immediately people I know, I can hear people saying, well, what about free will? Doesn't, doesn't God call us to respond and, and, and respond to His call and we can resist it or this and that? That's the whole Armenian theology. Okay, that you can actually resist the call of God, right? You can resist God. Uh, it's not irresistible. That's the whole Calvinism, right? Uh, it's irresistible grace, which you, as you'll see, it's irresistible because uh, uh, not so much that, that we cannot resist it, we just can't do anything. God, ha God awakens us and thereby gives us the grace to actually receive Him. Um, but again, as I say this, obviously people who are thinking philosophically will say, how can you say that we are absolutely unable when God calls us to repent, right? Isn't there a human side to this? And the answer is, I don't get it. Yes, there's a human side to it, but clearly when this text says we're depraved, it, it's, it's a blanket universal statement. No man will ever want to even accept the things of the Spirit of God, even if he wanted to. <laughs> He's so depraved that he is completely unable. So one of the responses that we give to people who are Armenian uh, will say, well, if you're telling us that the human man can resist God, we will say the human being's will is affected by his own sinful what? Nature, which means that he will never even want to come near to God. But I want to go even further and say, there's just nothing in the man because of satanic opposition and because of his own nature that he will ever open his heart to the things of God at all. So what's, the, so what's the answer to that? It is that salvation is of God then. Look at Romans 8. I mean, in one sense, as you study this, you realize, even though you have to acknowledge that you have the ability to choose and you have man, you have a will there, as you study this, you realize salvation is truly the work of God. God and God, what? Alone. Uh, Romans 8, 30, it says, And these whom He predestined, He also called. Okay? And these He called, He justified. Well, you know, this calling is the effectual calling, meaning it's, it's, it's effective. It's going to produce the result. In fact, when He called this man, He began to believe, and He justified him. And those whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. So this verse clearly indicates that without and apart from a man's ability to believe, when God calls his elect, that elected man will be justified. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Let's turn to that passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. It says, But to those who are the what? The called. To those who are called. Now, again, this is not the general external call. Paul is saying those specific ones, referring to those who are effectually called or those who have been chosen of God. They've been elected. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, notice, 
Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of what? Of God. Okay? To those who are elected, it wasn't their power. Christ is the one with that power. So again, this is clearly the irresistible grace. When God calls a sinner and they've been elected, they don't, it's not that they resist. There's no like indication of any resisting. They will simply respond. And so that response, it might seem as if they have no choice of their own, but somehow or another, we will say, you know, I did believe. I did choose to repent. But then as you turn back, you realize, oh, it was His power that gave me the grace to what? Repent. So again, let's make this clear. We're not discounting man's ability to respond. Okay? But as we study this, does it seem as if a man has absolutely no will of his own? It seems to indicate that, but that's not the truth. The truth is, no man in his will will respond to God, but if you're the elect, and He calls you, He will enable you somehow to respond to Him. In your perspective, it will clearly feel like you are the one responding. And then as you look back to that time when you responded, you realize, oh, there's no way I could have done that on my my own. So if you ask me the question, Pastor Chi, did you respond? I'll say, I did. Do you believe? I say, I I repented. I did that. And then I stop and I say, by the grace of what? God. So again, it's, it's, it's one of those where there's no way to reconcile. I chose God by His grace, you know? He helped me do it, but I chose Him. I cannot reconcile those two and we're not supposed to. So the scripture does not discount both. Armenians are saying, you could only have one or what? Or the other. You cannot say man has free will and God controls everything. That's a paradox. We will say it's an apparent paradox. It seems like a paradox, but it's really what? It's really not. Do I get it? I don't because I am not God. I don't know how He created life you know, in its reality. But in my experience, do I know I believed? Have I been convicted? I knew in my heart that God was Christ and I had to turn to Him and the answer is, yes, I did. And I don't shy away from saying that. But I have to always qualify that and say, it was all by His what? His grace. He made me. And I'll say, then who saved you? I'll say, God saved me. Who made you believe? God made me believe. Well, doesn't that mean you have no free will? No, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) He gave me the grace to believe and I what? I believe. So, number one, how does this calling work? There has to be what you call the internal call. Okay. So in your testimony, you have to ask yourself as you look back, was there a time when He called you and you were drawn to Him and you believed? Secondly, the, the effects of this is that there must be a spiritual an emotional response. You, you, you can't just believe and not feel anything. Okay? It, it, that doesn't make sense biblically. Okay? You know, when you meet God for the first time and you meet your Creator, there should be joy, right? There should be, you know, but we're talking about here the first emotional response that you should, that should be there is, is is conviction of sin. Okay. Guilt. Well, some people will say, no, I got saved when I felt the love of God. <sighs> okay. No sin, no conviction of sin. And they'll, you know, I've heard some people say this, well, I start to realize what sin was afterwards. Like, what? What? See, when a sinner meets his maker you, you, you should feel guilty I mean how did the prodigal son feel when he went back to his dad okay dad uh, I know you love me da, 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 da. no that guy was so fraught with guilt he couldn't even look up 
He said, I am unworthy. I don't deserve to be your son. I, I, I want to be your slave. Just make me one of your slaves. And then he felt the love of what? His father. And so, the, you know, when, there, when the internal call is given, the, from your perspective as a man or a woman, there must be the, I would say, biblically, the piercing of the heart. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when Peter preached the gospel to the first 3,000 first 3, Jews who were saved, it says, they were pierced to the heart, they were cut to the heart, and from their conviction, they cried out, what should we do? Okay. So when the Lord calls a sinner, it's like a big package. He's calling them, He's convicting them of their sin, um, Matthew, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 to 6. And again, there are too many churchgoers whose testimonies differ from Matthew chapter 5. You know, you have to ask yourself, does my testimony match up with Jesus' first sermon about the kingdom of God? It says, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice verse 3 Poorness of spirit leads you into the kingdom of heaven. And verse um, 10 ends with the same phrase. For theirs is the kingdom of uh, heaven. So it, all the Beatitudes are sandwiched between the two results of the kingdom of heaven. This is basically talking about someone who've been, en who's entered into the kingdom of heaven. In our terminology, this is conversion. This, it's not some um, poetic, quaint, you know, nice, you know, spiritual poetry. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. You know, like, just kind of like reading it and thinking like, oh, that's such a wonderful, you know, things that a Christian should do, right? He is gentle, right? They don't like to talk about mourning. Gentle, hunger in spirit, meek, pure in the heart, you know, like, just something, some religious things. This is a testimony of a, of a sinner who's been converted. Okay? One, he's pierced to the heart. He recognizes he's poor in the spirit. What is that? That's another way of saying he's convicted of his what? Of his sins. He, he is... You can read it like this. Blessed are those who have been awakened to the destitution of their spiritual life before God. You're so poor, okay? There are, I think, um, different word. Yeah, there are, I was about to say nine. That's the next one. In the Greek, the word poor for sh this one is patokos. There's a different word for poor in the Greek called penikros. Uh, when Jesus saw the poor woman putting her two coins into that temple treasury, he used penny cross. He means, look at that poor woman. She's poor, but she still had two what? Two or three coins. So she's poor, but she still had what? Something. The Greek word here, patokos, means you have absolutely nothing. In fact, it was, it was, it was a word of shame. Uh, like to talk about these beggars who they were so ashamed of their nothingness that they had no dignity to even look at the person that they're asking for money it was a word to indicate shame um, embarrassment uh, complete dependence on some external thing to let to help you survive well this is when the lord opens a person's heart when he recognizes that he's poor in the spirit and he confesses that before god the kingdom of heaven the treasures and all the glories of heaven is now given to that person. 
It's kind of like saying, when were you convicted about your sin? When were you pierced the heart? You know, and the second one, blessed are those who mourn. That's the physical response. So what you have in verse 3 is the spiritual recognition of your condition. And then you have the physical response, the emotional response. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's not talking about like, are you sad in life? God wants to help you, that kind of thing. This mourning is, an, is a reaction to the recognition of the poorness of his heart. It's like someone, he gets up in the morning, looks at himself in the mirror, and sees how pathetic he is. And he just starts weeping. Like, how can I be such a, re- a messed up man? You know, you hear about these People who uh, did some crime and after several years or they look in the mirror, they just felt so guilty. They just weep uncontrollably. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this is what it is. This man, he sees, he sees the reflection of God's holiness and he sees his reflection as he is so black in his heart. Like if you were, like in Spurgeon's language, if you were to take your heart and you squeeze out every drop of blackness in your heart, and you squeeze them one more time, more blackness will just keep coming out. You're, you're just so, so dirty. And you mourn. And the word for mourn here, there, there's actually nine Greek terms for mourning. And this is the ninth one, the severest one. It, it, it was used of a person who's, whose loved one passed away and they, they're just wailing uncontrollably for hours on end. This person... He's wailing and weeping because he sees, he sees his dirtiness before God. But you see, when the person takes his sin that seriously and he mourns, that's the person who's comforted. So this verse is a promise that if you take your sin seriously, you will be forgiven. You know, so like if you have to apply this, it's saying rather than going to a therapist or some psychologist to tell you that you're okay, go to God and rather than trying to justify what you've done, simply admit you sinned and when you own up to what you've done before God and you mourn, you will be comforted. Meaning true forgiveness will actually be there. And I think one psychiatrist said, man, if I can only convince my patients that they're forgiven, all of them will be cured. He goes, people in my psychiatric ward are so fraught with guilt, they just won't forgive themselves. That they can move on with their life. Well, as true as that might be, you have to understand, one reality to this is that no one can forgive themselves. You know, hear people say things like, just forgive yourself, just let it go. This verse is saying, don't let it go. Take it to God, mourn, and weep. You know, James chapter 4 says that, right? Turn with me to James 4. You know, it's, it's really sad because if you don't understand this, and most people don't, they're walking around with guilt, unforgiven, un. Um, un Un, unresolved guilt, basically. Look at verse 8. This is the instruction of what to do when you sin. Draw near to God. That's the first step. Go to God. He will draw near to you. What a promise. You, you, you sin against Him. Okay, go, go to God. And then it says, cleanse your hands. Okay, He means come clean, right? You sinners. Purify your hearts. Repent, you double-minded. Be miserable. Mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. You know, there's passages in the Bible where it says rejoice always, right? I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Well, we rejoice when we're walking in Christ, but when we sin, we should not be rejoicing. We should be what? Mourning. But notice, it never says mourn so that you'll feel better. It says, when you mourn in the right way, He will lift you up. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. 
and he will what? Exalt you. You see, people today in the church still are in, in guilt because they have not mourned. Why? Because all the pastors are saying, hey, don't go back and relive your guilt. Don't go back. Just let it go. Pass and move on. Jesus died for you. Just know that Jesus loves you. That's all you need to do. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. So, if you feel guilty, that's Satan. If you feel, you know, if you remember the things you've done and you feel guilty, that's Satan. I would say, it's not Satan. It's the Holy Spirit bringing you to that remembrance because maybe you have not mourned over it enough. Now, I'm not saying like you got to mourn to a certain way, right? Roar! Like cry like a certain amount before God forgives you. It's not saying that. It's just saying humble yourself. It's like it's contrition, true humility, like Lord, owning up to it. I have sinned. Now, it's not Satan. Why? Because if you look at verse, um, verse 7, it says, submit therefore to God, resist the what? Resist the devil. By the way, the devil, most of the time, he will not condemn you. He will, he will affirm you. He'll justify what you've done. He'll tell you, no, you don't, you don't really have to say sorry. Uh, if he does condemn you, it's like a... It's like a morbid con condemnation that there's no hope of you at all. It's like one extreme or the other. It's never true conviction of sin where you turn to God you know, for, for mercy. But one of the sad things about today's Christian culture is that you have so many people who have not yet properly taken their sin seriously and mourn. They brush it off. They know it's wrong, but they brush it off quickly saying, I shouldn't feel that guilty because I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. There are times when I've mourned for days. I just felt so bad. Just walking around dejected. When I, was, I remember when I, you know, college years, dealing with some of, some of my personal sins, and I just could not smile. And, and rightly so. But did the Lord remove that and bring joy to my heart? Absolutely. Like, I look back, I remember what I've done. I don't feel guilty. I mean, I, I feel bad, yeah, but I don't feel the guilt anymore. It's gone, literally gone. And that's the promise. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. God miraculously will remove the actual feeling of guilt where you will feel free no matter what you've done in the, what? In the past. But the process to that is, is proper mourning uh, contrition uh, and repentance uh, in your heart. So it's not just feeling bad, obviously. It's in your heart, as it says right here, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts. It's saying, put that sin away from your heart right now. Make that commitment. And then if you turn back to Matthew 5, the same thing occurs. Um, and this is, this is more clear uh, in Matthew 5. When a person mourns over their sin and takes it seriously and weeps, What's the result? He becomes gentle. Verse 5. Blessed are the, are the gentle. What does that mean? Uh, the word gentle in the Greek is praos. And I love this word because, you know, because it's, it's talking about an animal that has like like, it was untamed, but is now tamed, like a horse. Uh, I remember riding a horse in Arkansas at my friend's farm. I, I really think horses are dinosaurs, okay? Like, they, they, they don't look like dinosaurs, like the one we see in museums, but when you ride one, you, it is amazing how big they are, and they are so strong, right? They're a beast. This horse can kill me, and yet amazingly, it's tamed. It, it's, it, you, you, you know, you'll go where you tell it to go. You know, you make two clicks with your tongue and it'll move to the left or, you know, the way the owner trained it. How, how does this fit? Well, when, when you've truly felt the guilt of your sin, you, you literally break down where you no longer struggle against God. That's the idea here. You've been gentled. Okay, I guess you could put it that way. 
You're, you're, you're no longer like a horse kicking. You're just there. You got this energy in you, but it's no longer like, I just want to do my way. You're not controllable. You are, you are bendable. You're, you're still. That's, you know, when the, when the, when in the Psalms, when King David says, be still and know that I am God. That, that's that's just what, what it's saying. Because you're, you're no longer going to fight against God anymore. In your will, you've given up. That's the idea. You are gentle. You are like a horse, tamed. You're ready to just do the master's bidding. And that's why in verse 6, you're moving now. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's now the positive side to conversion. The negative side is up to verse 3, three 4, and 5. You are convicted of sin. You're mourning over your sin. And now you've, you're, you're just like, you're just broken down. You're still. You know, you're just weak. You're just like, I, I'm not going to do anything. And now you're moving. You're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And it says you'll be satisfied. And next thing you know, you're now merciful to other people. You're loving. You're pure in heart because all you can do now, remember, you started off with a black heart in verse 3. In verse 8, now you're what? Pure. You shall see God. And now to people, you become a peacemaker. You're not fighting people anymore. You're loving them. In verse 10, people are now angry at you because you've been forgiven. They hate God. Now they hate what? You, you're being persecuted. Okay, does that make sense? This is the process of conversion here. Okay, this is, our, this is, this is an outline of all true testimonies that, that you need to give indication somehow that you've been broken of your sin, broken of your pride, broken of your self-will. You responded by faith. You're now seeking after righteousness and holiness, meaning you're hungering and you're thirsting. You're not just doing one or the other. It's both. Your whole life is now consumed with wanting to be righteous in the eyes of God. You've been justified righteous, yes, but the pursuit is now happening. Um, there's no qualification, no disclaimer, no holds barred. You're, you're going to be holy. So, this is the internal call. When, when God calls someone, the sinner will move. Okay? He, his will will now be moved. He in his will will move to God, responding by faith. What's occurring in his heart? There is a spiritual and an emotional response, conviction of sin, a mourning over your sin, becoming gentle. Okay? And then there's joy. Okay, verse 3. I mean, number 3. Okay? There's the, the ecstatic joy. Uh, Matthew 13. Turn with me to Matthew 13. Verse 44. It's, it's, really, it's really not... It's really strange. Um, it's not right. It's, it's strange when you see people who... Who they you know get baptized in the church, they give testimony that they're saved, and, and then suddenly they're like struggling with finances, like money or covetousness, or just you know, lack of joy or whatever. They're they're like not as excited, you know. And and, and it's not about because they're convicted of certain sin, it's there's still like this love for this world. Look at verse 44. Matthew 13, verse 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Now, is this teaching that we can get salvation by buying it? No. The illustration is not about purchasing salvation at all. It, the illustration is about the sacrifice that a man will make to get this thing because it brings him so much happiness. He will stop literally at nothing to get this treasure, whether it's in the field or this pearl of great what? Great price. 
and is referring to salvation. And what he's saying is those who are saved will be so overjoyed, nothing will compare. Nothing. Mom and dad won't compare. Family won't compare. Your job, money, lifestyle, friends, activities on earth, nothing compares. It, it literally says you will give all of that what? Up because of the joy that you have of finding the kingdom of heaven or the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, which is, which is Christ. Okay. So, if you had to dumb it down to three steps or three particular aspects of the internal call, I would say when God calls someone you know, through the preaching of the gospel, and you're looking at what happens in that, in that center, there will be obviously a will that starts moving completely to the obedience of Christ. There will be initial conviction of sin, a piercing of the heart of what he's done wrong. There will be mourning, the response to that sin. Then there will be a calming part because God just lifts all that guilt from him and comforts that man. Okay, Now you're ready to serve. And then third, joy. There is like, like an unending um, recognition that I've gained the most important thing in, in life. So I would say salvation is the most joyous experience we would ever go through. And then next to that is, in my perspective, is, is marriage. You know? um, and, and the other joys, children, you know, all those lesser joys, but nonetheless joyous. But the greatest joy is the joy of our what? Our salvation. And so, again, you hear people and they don't talk about this joy. Like, sometimes they're, 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 there's three parts to a testimony, right? There's the pre-salvation, and then the second step is how I got saved. And then the third one, they'll start mentioning what they do for God. It, you know, it's okay if you don't mention that. You should be mentioning the unending joy that you experience after conversion. Wow, I'm going to go to heaven, be with Christ forever. I've been forgiven of all my what? Guilt. And if you ask again, why is he, this guy so joyous? Well, in this illustration, it's because of the value, right? He's got treasure. And this pull is worth more than anything I have. But this is just an illustration. The key here, there's joy because of what? There's forgiveness. And there's what? Reconciliation. We're talking, we, we're talking about relationship. The joy is from the uh, mending of the relationship between you and your Creator. Yeah. So, in one way or another, your salvation, your co conversion testimony should have some of these components. Okay? If not, I would encourage you to really think about maybe that day wasn't the day you were saved, or maybe it happened afterwards, or maybe it's happening now, or, you know? Um, you know, there might be um, certain discrepancies. You're like, whoa! I don't want to say that I'm not saved, but yeah, I mean, some of this stuff, like, I mean, can I just say that it's better to just, you know, these are things you learn afterwards? No, I, I, I you can't, because all of this is talking about the moment of what? Of conversion uh, of every sinner. And so we either fit this picture or we're not converted. Yeah. Um... Now, see, this is where pastors start capitulating. After they teach all this, and someone goes, Well, pastor, are you saying that I'm not saved? They're like, well, I mean, I mean, you believe now, right? Yeah, you're saved. <laughs> well, you can see the pressure that we have. After we say this, now, we, now they want affirmation from the man. I guess the response should be, I am not the judge. <laughs> you must judge yourself. Do you feel, do you feel guilty? <laughs> okay, let's, you know. So I, I, cannot, I cannot affirm nor deny, okay? I cannot confirm nor deny, you know? Um, but I know for a fact that this is true. I mean, this is 
this is what everything about this is from the whole process of salvation and conversion. We have to fit the scriptures. If not, then something's wrong. And we have to own up to it no matter how how we feel. I remember feeling so strongly that I could speak in tongues. I had to give that up. Uh, I believe I was saved my second year in college. Um, I was studying a book by Michael Horton who was expositing Romans 3, 10 through 12 about total depravity. And I, can, I remember that night what I understood. Because that was the first time I actually did real Bible study. Like I read the Bible seven times before that. I went through all the other Bible studies with teachers. This was the first time the Bible started to speak out. Like I was like, well, I was reading you know, his explanation and it just started to make so much sense. And then it dawned on me, I've never chosen to believe God on my own. I'm a wretched sinner. All this time I thought I was seeking God, He sought me. And then my pride was crushed. I felt guilty. I felt so remorseful. And then the joy set in after I confessed all my sin. And I was just so thankful and happy after that moment. Um, and then I, and then it slow, and then I sl- slowly start to grow. But yeah, I look at that day as the day when the Lord brought that joy into my heart of knowing I've truly been now become one with Christ. See, up to that point, I went to retreat every single year, and I was very religious, and I really thought I was close to God. Like you know, from my eight, uh, not from my seventh grade. I went to church all my life, but it wasn't until 8th grade that I had a youth pastor up to my senior in high school. And it was like church life completely. Like if you saw me then, I mean, I was evangelizing. I was bringing people to church, teaching the Bible, leading praise. I was as Christian as you can get. But it dawned on me in my second year in college from that study. It was all not a, it wasn't fake, but it wasn't genuine reconciliation with Christ. That's what I recognized. And so, you know, that's my testimony uh, by God, by God's grace. So I want to encourage you, you know, really think about it. Uh, let this sink into your heart. And if you have questions, we'll talk. But remember, I'm not going to be the one affirming or denying. Okay, you need to come to grips with the truth on your own. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Um, there's a uh, I think there's so much, there's others, uh, there's more to cover, but we're going to kind of wrap it up uh, and next week just kind of summarize everything so that it'll become more, you know, clear in a uh, summarized fashion. Uh, But Father, we really want to uh, emphasize in this ministry uh, the clarity and the depth of the gospel message and talk about salvation because that is the most important thing that the church exists to minister people to. Uh, It's not so much um, our social life or even so much our just, you know, spirituality. Uh, The church exists to give the gospel message so that those who are truly saved will be brought into the church and baptized and recognized as believers. While we do not know exactly what is in a person's heart, we cannot judge a person. Yet the scripture gives us enough criteria for us to judge ourselves and discern. But Father, uh, we need your wisdom, your help. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us in this endeavor. Father, would you uh, grow this ministry with true conversions of sinners? um, And that as a church, we would be filled with people who are truly converted, worshiping Christ uh, with a united voice and heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.